Uh, but tonight's presentation, as I mentioned, comes from Dr. Kunde Alalike. Uh, he is the professor of, a, a professor of history, excuse me, and the director of African and African American Studies at Iowa State University. Uh, he is a Nigerian and has published extensively on African, uh, Africa, Black America relations, uh, Black nationalism, and Pan Africanism. Our talk tonight focuses on the central theme in his recently published book, Africa in Black Liberation Activism. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Tunde. First of all, I want to thank you for coming. And also, I want to thank the museum and the Humanities Iowa for inviting me and making me part of this series. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as Sean mentioned, this is uh, actually the central theme uh, in my recently published book, uh, just published in January, uh, Africa and Black Liberation Activism. One of the central questions that infused the black American experience from the very beginning of the history was a question that uh, the Harlem Renaissance poet, County Colin, asked in his epic poem, Heritage. And that question is simply, what is Africa to me? And he goes on to you know, provide some images that Africa exemplified. Many of, most of them negative images. That question, I argue, remains today the central question that is still being asked and has not been satisfactorily answered as far as the challenges of the black American experience. In my book, I focus on three 20th century black nationalists and activists who attempted to answer that question. And what you are going to see is fundamentally how they agreed in their answers to that question. And also how in the end, two of them disagreed in the answer to that question. And in that very disagreement, that very disagreement that occurred in the late 60s, today is at the center of some of the discourses that we are now having as to what direction should the future of black diaspora studies take. Now, let me mention those three individuals. Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, and Walter Rodney. By the mid-1960s, the African and black diaspora struggles have attained significant, albeit incomplete, and in some cases, compromised victories. There were concerns about the challenges of protecting what many perceived to be fundamentally fragile achievements. The Pan-Africanism that helped birth decolonization in Africa was in decline. The civil rights movement in America was mired in factional and ideological conflict. In parts of Africa, political independence resulted in unstable neocolonial states. There were renewed threats of bitter conflict between the push for continental unity and emerging micro-nationalism aimed at protecting national sovereignties. In the United States, Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream remained distant and elusive. In local and rural communities across the country, blacks confronted recalcitrant racist establishment opposed to change. The prospect in both Africa and the diaspora seemed less than promising. The fundamental challenge was how to strengthen the hard-won, albeit fragile, reforms and guarantee a secure future for Africa and her diaspora. This also entailed determining which location offered greater prospects for solidifying the future. Africa became that location. Among 20th century black diaspora activists who advanced this Africa-centered paradigm, none more vocal than Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, and Walter Rodney. They each theorized Africa as liberation paradigm. 
Carmichael reflected the prevailing conviction when he declared Africa, quote, sin qua non for diaspora blacks. The source of inspiration at critical moments of diasporic pessimism. Few historical epochs embodied that pessimism as the 1960s, a pessimism induced by the tension between heightened expectation on the one hand and concerns about the fragility of change on the other. Within the radical wings of the black resistance in America, some began to search for an alternative strategy that would relocate the epicenter from the diaspora to Africa, redirecting the movement away from the destructive path Carmichael believed it was headed. By 1967, Carmichael concluded that the black trouble in America had reached a critical crossroads of confusion and seemingly endless violence. Frustrated and desperately in need of ideological reinforcement, he left the country. In fact, Malcolm X had mapped the course three years earlier when he withdrew from the Nation of Islam. In 1964, Malcolm launched a new movement, Muslim Mosque International, and signaled a resolve to move in Africa's direction. Several factors precipitated Malcolm's decision, not the least of which was disillusionment with the enforced apolitical ideology of the Nation of Islam. Elijah Muhammad had declared Africa irrelevant to the challenges Black confronted and discouraged his followers from looking toward and actively seeking linkages with events in the continent at a critical historical moment when Africa's decolonization was profoundly reshaping global power relations. Malcolm found this anti-Africa policy disconcerting, and in a stunning disavowal, he embraced Africa. In April of 1964, he embarked on the first of a series of trips to Africa. He visited and solicited support of leading progressive African leaders and nations, including Ghana, Nigeria, Guinea, Egypt, Tanzania, and Algeria. Malcolm offered two explanations for prioritizing Africa, one of them philosophical, some will say psychological, the other pragmatic. The first derived from his attribution of much of the challenges blacks confronted to psychological dysfunction. In what became the canonical statement of liberation philosophy, of Malcolm's liberation philosophy, he declared, quote, of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward our efforts, unquote. He will reiterate this statement of historical determinism in subsequent speeches and publications, often when reflecting on the daunting task of eradicating that challenging pathology Kataji Woodson diagnosed much earlier, the miseducation, or what some today would say, diseducation of the Negro. Malcolm argued that centuries of oppression in America had nurtured negative self-loathing values that stymied drives for self-determination, fed historical falsehood, blacks were, not surprisingly, overwhelmed by feelings of worthlessness and inferiority complex. Reversing this condition required sustained research into and a revisionist interpretation of African history. As he reasoned, quote, once you see that the condition that we are in is directly related to our lack of knowledge concerning the history of the black man, only then can you realize the importance of knowing something about the history of the black man, unquote. The pragmatic factor entailed harnessing the power of Africa's post-colonial leadership. Malcolm believed that the emerging political landscape in Africa offered the framework for a global realignment of struggles of oppressed minorities. He was convinced that Africa possessed the resources, socioeconomic, cultural, and political, that will empower diverse colored populations worldwide. In Malcolm's view, these resources underscored Africa's capacity for global stewardship. Contrary to popular interpretations, therefore, Malcolm's turn to Africa was not motivated solely by the desire to, quote, internationalize the struggle by shifting from civil to human rights. Neither was it driven by an obsession with shaming and indicting the United States before the United Nations. Malcolm believed that the challenges blacks, blacks confronted had become transnational and transracial 
transcending and thus obliterating boundaries that once defined distinct spheres of resistance. Put differently, he believed that the black struggles had morphed beyond America and had become intertwined with those of similarly oppressed and impoverished groups in the Caribbean, in Latin America, in South and Central America, and in Asia. Malcolm also suggested that the character of the participants had changed. They were no longer just Afro-Americans of American history. Advancing a global framing of Afro-American, Malcolm insisted that the moniker should no longer be confined to the one group with which it had historically been associated, Americans of African ancestry. During his mission of Islam years, Malcolm had used this term exclusively in reference to this group. The African experience and global reconstruction of the struggle compel broadening and reformulation of its meaning. Expanding the revolutionary constituency and consistent with his colored cosmopolitan paradigm, Malcolm, reconcept Malcolm since reconceptualized Afro-American now included colored populations in Latin America, Central and South America, the Caribbean and Asia. As he, as he said, unquote, quote, many of us fool ourselves into thinking of Afro-Americans as those in the United States. America is not America. Central America and South America. Anybody of African ancestry in South America is an Afro-American. Anybody in Central America of African blood is an Afro-American. The Afro-American is that large number of people in the Western Hemisphere. Based on this broadening conception of Afro-American, Malcolm theorized that Afro-American struggles are now happening in different locations outside of the United States. And the prospect for triumph more promising through linkages as opposed to racialized strategies. Each location, he said, encompassed oppressed, marginalized, and impoverished people struggling against colonial and neocolonial hegemony. He portrayed Africa as the framework for solidifying the struggles in these multiple sites of resistance. Thus, Malcolm acknowledged both the complexity of the revolutionary constituencies and the imperative of solidarity. He amplified the colored cosmopolitan worldview developed much earlier by Marcus Garvey and William E.B. Du Bois. In the philosophy of in, in his The Philosophy and Opinion published in 1923, Garvey described Africa as a continent that would determine the future and development of global colored communities. Reiterating this theme, Malcolm observed that, quote, the black revolution has been taking place in Africa, in Asia, and Latin America. And when I say black, I mean non-white, black, brown, yellow, and yellow, unquote. Furthermore, Malcolm argued that the term Afro-American could no longer be construed as a racial or ethnic identity, but a condition that described different groups across nations and continents who shared challenges and whose future now depended on Africa. Malcolm's new Africa paradigm not only compelled broadening of both the constituencies and boundaries of the revolution, but also complicated the racialist values and biases that had traditionally defined for many, including Malcolm, the parameters of the black American struggle. Of the African nations and leaders he visited, Malcolm singled out Ghana's president, Kwame Nkrumah, and the Pan-African ideology he theorized for actualizing Africa's global responsibility. Upon assuming the presidency in 1957, Nkrumah had characterized Ghana's independence as incomplete without a corresponding independence and unification of the entire continent. He described the attainment of national sovereignties as only a milestone in the quest for the more profound goal of continental unification. The Pan-African ideology dovetailed with Malcolm's vision of a global colored cosmopolitan revolution. During his consultations with African leaders, Malcolm stressed the need for unity and commitment to the Pan-African vision. He urged the leaders to acknowledge the linkage between Africa and the global struggles of oppressed colored peoples. He applauded their decision to establish the Organization of African Unity in 1963, a development that, in his judgment, symbolized the evolving spirit of Pan-Africanism. Upon returning to the United States, Malcolm launched a similar movement, the Organization of Afro-American Unity. 
Consistent with the expansive interpretation of Afro-American, Malcolm proposed a global reach and appeal for the OAAU. The, his Africa visit enabled him to gain nuanced understanding of the complexities of the progressive and revolutionary ideas and worldview. He began to question the racial binary that had defined his nation of Islam career. He now understood the importance of working with diverse people. His definition of black nationalism an ideology he embodied and with which his name became synonymous also changed. He now acknowledged that the issues that infused nationalist aspirations were complex and that they transcended race. He could not help but notice that the African leaders he, whose support he solicited were actually avowedly anti-racist. They would not have endorsed an appeal for support premised on race. Going to Africa convinced Malcolm that the future of the black struggle depended on unity of and the cooperation of diverse groups. Consequently, he publicly renounced his old racial persona and declares his intention to steer the black struggle across the racial divide. Africa also enhanced Malcolm's understanding of political and revolutionary leadership. As a nation of Islam devotee, he embraced and he was raised in a messian messianic leadership tradition, exemplified by the representation of Elijah Muhammad as God's chosen servant, whose words were sacrosanct and authority infallible. Malcolm's re reorientation toward Africa compelled rethinking. The progressive leaders with whom he had lengthy discussions and whose assistance he sought were people oriented and focused on secular strategies. Their religions did not dictate or shape their policies. They were also mostly middle class, though some were of much humbler origins. Collectively, they seemed to embrace a servant leadership tradition. They prioritized the needs, the interests, and aspirations of the underprivileged. And their policies reflected the fundamental, that fundamental consideration. It was no coincidence that some of them were actually abandoning the capitalist economy associated with colonial exploitation for some form of socialism, be it African socialism or adaptations of Marxist-Leninist ideology. The nation of Islam worldview now seemed obsolete to Malcolm and ill-adapted to the challenges confronting blacks and the global struggles. Malcolm therefore positioned the OAAU, not the MMI, at the vanguard of his revolutionary initiative to coordinate with oppressed peoples in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, in South and Central America. But Malcolm would not leave to, visual, to, to realize this vision. As we all know, he was assassinated in February of 1965. But by the time of his death, Malcolm had infused the rising militant generation with his globalized vision. Some in the leadership of this generation had become disillusioned and in need of reorientation. None more so than Stokely Carmichael, who as a student at Howard University had idolized Malcolm and closely followed his activities. In fact, he had also read Malcolm's writings, particularly those dealing with Pan-Africanism and the colored cosmopolitan ideology. Carmichael was a veteran of the civil rights struggles who had marched alongside Martin Luther King Jr. In fact, it was in the civil rights movement that he first caught his feet as a consummate revolutionary. Like Malcolm, by the mid-1960s, Carmichael too concluded that the American front of the struggle had become disorganized. The movement appeared to have lost its steam and merged in seemingly endless violent confrontations. Seeking a new direction, Carmichael embarked on a series of international lecture tours that took him to Britain, Cuba, Vietnam, and Africa. In what I characterize as the true Malcolmian tradition, Carmichael turned to Africa, settling permanently in Conakry, Guinea. This move reflected both self-criticism and acknowledgement that he was bereft of ideological options. He opted for a tactical retreat from the movement in America in order to seek re-education and ideological reinforcement in Africa. It should be noted that Carmichael turned to the same African leader Malcolm had identified as the person with the best strategy for, adv for advancing Africa's and global diasporic struggles, Kwame Nkrumah. He too saw Kwame Nkrumah's Pan-African ideology as a pathway to progress. In his London and Havana speeches, Carmichael adduced the same Malcolmian rationale 
for the global framing of the struggles. Like Malcolm, he renounced the racial binary that characterized his earlier struggles. Therefore, there is, however, a fundamental difference, I say, between Malcolm's renunciation and, and, and Carmichael. Malcolm sought to mobilize the resources of Africa for advancing multiple and complex color cosmopolitan revolutions. In Malcolm's schema, the regenerative force would flow out of Africa to multiple and distant sites of resistance. Carmichael's approach was different. He was not seeking the immediate dispersion of the power of Africa to distant location. His priority was to solidify that power within Africa. This meant, for Carmichael, strengthening the individual or individuals with the vision and platform to transform Africa into a formidable force whose influence and authority will reverberate globally. Although, like Malcolm, Carmichael endorsed globalizing the struggles, he emphasized our priori solidifying the foundation, which he argued rested squarely on the soldiers of two progressive African leaders whose qualities and policies exemplified in Carmichael's view indomitable resistance to foreign domination and exploitation, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana and Seko Toure of Guinea. <coughs> Carmichael now portrayed the movement and organization he once led in the United States and which were still active in the civil rights movement, like the Black Panther, Black Power. He described them as appendages and global extensions of Kwame Nkrumah's ideas and policies. The prospects of the global revolution now depended on development in Africa, specifically the ideas and policies of Nkrumah. Unfortunately, Nkrumah suffered a devastating setback. His Marxist ideology drove full feathers in the United States and among Western powers. He was ousted in what many believe was a military coup sponsored by the United States in 1966. He relocated to Guinea at the invitation of Seko Toure to assume the position of co-president of Guinea. This created a cru crucial national platform for continuation of Nkrumah's policies. Like Malcolm, Kamaiku believed that Nkrumah had already perfected the ideology and strategies for the global colored revolution. The immediate challenge, therefore, as Malcolm saw, as Kamaiku saw it, was restoring Nkrumah back to power in Ghana. For the next 30 years, Kamaiku lived in Guinea, learning from and helping to advance the ideas and policies of the co presidents. As Nkrumah's political secretary, Kamaiko benefited immensely and gained critical political insight. Nkrumah's stay in Guinea coincided with the most intellectually productive phase of his career. Kamaiko read Nkrumah's writings on revolutionary theories and blueprints for Africa. He became a dedicated student of the Nkrumah Toure School of African Political Philosophy, ultimately adopting their names as mark of political respect. Stokely Kamaiko became Kwame Toure. Learning Nkrumah's idea was a major consideration for, for Kamaiko's relocation to Guinea. However, his ultimate goal was restoring Nkrumah back to power in Ghana, upon which the entire African and global revolution depended. In preparation, Kamaiko devoted time to military training in Guinea. He also spent time conferring with Nkrumah about the revolutionary ideas and strategies for Africa and the global revolution. Consistent with his Pan-African vision, Nkrumah's plan called for the creation of a United States of Africa. He described the creation and consolidation of this supra-entity, the most effective revolutionary counterforce against the ever-present threat of neocolonialism. Nkrumah's blueprint, however, har harbored a disturbing anti-democratic value. He opposed concessions to democratic ideals, that is Nkrumah, contending that such concessions will only embolden and ultimately empower reactionary neocolonial agencies, such as the coup plotters that I've said here. Kamaikul envisioned the future of, a future of Nkrumah's restoration and subsequent implementation of his blueprint for Africa and the global revolution. Unfortunately, this will not happen. Nkrumah would die of cancer in Romania in 1971. Although devastating, this development did not extinguish Kamaikos's dream. He remained hopeful that the other half of the president of the co-presidency, Sekoture, 
will actualize the revolution. But challenges proved insurmountable for Sekotore. His presidency was marred by persistent coups and assassination attempts. This was further complicated by the fact that Guinea was surrounded by other hostile French West African territories, coupled with the ever-present threat of Portuguese-sponsored in 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 invasion. Nonetheless, Toure plowed on with unshakable faith in his people's capacity to overcome adversity. He and Carmichael were optimistic that Nkrumah's vision of a unified Africa, absent foreign exploitation and domination, will materialize. Unfortunately, Kamakusi's optimism suffered another devastating blow when, when Seko Toure died suddenly in a Cleveland, Ohio hospital in 1984. He now confronted, that is Kamakusi, now confronted a dilemma, remain in Guinea or return to the United States. With anti toure forces now in control and vigorously and vengefully pursuing and prosecuting former government officials, it was a matter of time before Kamakusi too would be targeted. Friends and family members in the United States pleaded in vain for Kamaikul to return to the US, but they had all misjudged his depth of commitment to Africa. Toure or no Toure, Kamaikul immersed himself deeper in local Guinean politics, even as he too was harassed by the military. He was arrested, he was put in jail. In the end, it would seem that Kamaikul derived consolation my argument, from a revolutionary lesson that his ideological mentor, Nkrumah, taught him. Quote, that the future of Africa did not rest on the shoulders of any single individual, but on the collective and indomitable will and determination of the people, striving toward freedom, even in the face of relentless and overwhelming adversity. As Nkrumah explained in a letter to Grace Box, quote, revolutionary struggle is a constant matter of ups and downs, of advances and retreat, of attacks and repulse. Though he, the individual, die in the process, he has not failed. The sum total of his endeavors, his aspirations, his efforts merges with the people to continue toward freedom." Unquote. Thus, Kamakul dropped on gallantly against formidable challenges. Unfortunately, he too would not live to realize this grand objective. He died of cancer and was buried in Conakry in 1998. Undoubtedly, I argue, on his deathbed, even as he took his last breath, Kamaikul would have recalled with a tinge of reassurance, perhaps even a smile, Nkrumah's reassuring words on, quote, the inevitability of the African Revolution, unquote. Walter Rodney, like Malcolm, believed in the potency of history as a weapon of change. Knowledge of African history was crucial to the Black Revolution, Rodney argued. As he once declared, quote, in order to know ourselves, we must learn about African history and culture, unquote. This inspired his decision to study African history. He gra after graduating with a first class honors from the University of the West Indies in 1963, Rodney gained admission to the University of London from where he obtained his doctoral degree in history in 1966. Upon graduation, Rodney signaled his intention to use his scholarship specifically for challenging Eurocentric historiography. His research and publications will engage and expose, he argued, the modus operandi of imperialism, focusing on and identifying the nature and sources of the problems bedeviling Africans and diaspora blacks. He quickly embraced the function of a revolutionary persona he characterized as guerrilla intellectual, a subversive, anti-colonial intellectual embedded in the ac academy. Africa became for Rodney, as it was for Malcolm and Carmichael, the force that would solidify the global struggles of oppressed people. Rodney, however, considered knowledge of African history only a pivotal step, not the end. Having studied African history, one had to be in Africa physically in order to acquire much needed practical knowledge and critical consciousness that will enhance one's role as a GI, the gorilla intellectual. As he explained, quote, I also felt that one of the ways in which 
one could mobilize was by picking up a certain amount of information within an experience on the African continent itself, unquote. Shortly after earning his PhD, Rodney accepted a lecturer position at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. It is significant to note that Rodney, like Michael, who relocated to Guinea, chose a country with an aggressive anti-colonial agenda. President Julius Nyerere was then experimenting with radical socialist reform rooted in indigenous African culture, Ujamaa. As a Marxist and advocate of scientific socialism, Rodney hoped to work alongside fellow Marxists at Dar es Salaam, able to teach and develop scientific socialist ideas, unquote. <clears throat> this occurred at a time when intellectuals across Africa debated the role of the university in emerging post-colonial states. In Tanzania, as in other former British colonies, universities were perceived as aristocratic institutions that reinforced, not challenged, reinforced the status quo. In other words, they were bastions of privilege for the middle and upper strata of society. In Tanzania, Rodney identified two levels of the struggles that he theorized also existed in other places, the academy, in the university, and the community. Within the university, Rodney argued that Rodney and a group of leftist scholars engaged in teaching, research, and helping to raise students' consciousness. Outside the university, Rodney observed that there were what he called real contradictions, class contradictions, unquote. Consequently, he, ex he expanded the scope of guerrilla intellectualism or activism. In the tradition of his ideological mentor, scholar activist Amilcar Cabral of Guinea-Bissau, Rodney insisted that the GI had to be willing to commit class suicide by actively seeking out and engaging the external struggles, identifying with the oppressed, sharing their burdens, and helping to raise their revolutionary consciousness, while also motivating them to become active agents of their own liberation. Rodney's intellectual achievements and theoretical insights notwithstanding, he quickly realized that being non-Tanzanian had limited his ability to participate effectively in the external struggle in the community. That is, he could not effectively commit that class struggle that he says was not really significant. This led him to conclude that only indigenous intellectuals who possess the capacity to bridge both fronts of the struggles. Rodney therefore urged the GIs working in foreign environments to, quote, recognize certain limits in any given political situations, limits of culture, limits of one's legal and citizenship rights, quote. Limits that acknowledge the fundamental difference in the language of communication between the academy and the community. In the case of Tanzania, English in the university, Swahili also greater community. Due to the above constraints and limitations, Rodney advised GIs working in foreign environments to confirm their identity, to confine their identities or their activism within the university and leave the outside political struggles to indigenous. Rodney therefore felt handicapped in Tanzania. Though he had the requisite academic qualification, but his non-indigenous status bolstered in him a disconcerting feeling of cultural deficiency. Consequently, in 1968, he abruptly ended his stay and decided to return to the West Indies, where he thought he could exercise both intellectual and cultural competencies. He accepted the teaching position at his alma mater in Kingston, Jamaica. Unfortunately, Rodney's return home will be short-lived. His guerrilla activism proved threatening to the government, which promptly barred him from returning to the country after a trip to Montreal, Canada, to attend the Black Writers you know, uh, Congress. His cultural deficiency notwithstanding, Rodney returned to his old position in Tanzania. And for the next several years, he unleashed his intellectual guerrilla activism against neocolonial interest. This period actually witnessed the publication of much of his combative and iconic anti-imperialist writings, perhaps the most prominent being How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, published in 1969. 
Ultimately, Rodney gained proficiency in Swahili. And combined with his prodigious scholarship, it seemed he had finally achieved the requisite qualification as a foreign GI able to straddle both sections of the struggle. Yet, the feeling of cultural inadequacy persisted. The fact is that Rodney never felt completely at home in Tanzania. His view of revolution possibly explains the persistence of cultural deficiency syndrome. He described a revolution, a successful revolution, as the primary responsibility of, quote, the people who are going to be grounded in that situation, who are going to stay there, who are going to make it part of their lives, unquote. In other words, the people who led such revolution must be culturally rooted in the community. The educated GI is most effective, according to Rodney, when culturally rooted as well. The GI has to function within his or her native cultural environment, where he or she possesses not only the history and language, but most critically, mastery of the nuances and idiosyncrasies that will, quote, break those boundaries, unquote, separating the university and the community. Rodney's experience in Tanzania suggested it would be difficult for a GI working within a foreign culture to attain the depth of gorilla, the, the depth of cultural grounding that will facilitate merging theory and practice. His challenge clearly underscored the limitations of academic qualifications. In fact, culture was a more critical factor. And as Rodney explained, quote, one must know that society, that environment. One must have a series of responses and reflexes that come from having lived a given experience. One must be able to share a joke because of a nuance in language and pronunciation, unquote. Proficiency in Swahili notwithstanding, Rodney felt handicapped by inability to master the cultural idiosyncrasies that would have helped him to develop those responses and reflexes with which to engage both levels of the struggle in Tanzania. So he was confined to the university and limited to engaging other intellectuals at the level of theory, isolated from the equally important function of grounding with the Tanzanian masses. Rodney concluded, therefore, that his days in Africa were numbered. Acknowledging the magnitude of the challenge, Rodney wrote, quote, it would take virtually a lifetime to master that language and then master the level of, the, the level of perception that goes with the culture, unquote. He now concluded, he now considered that Africa was, quote, never an end in itself. It was always a means to an end, he said. He was always with the understanding that I will return to the Caribbean, unquote. Though troubled by the realization that he could never master the skills and cultural competency necessary to effectively function as a GI in Tanzania or anywhere else in Africa, Rodney felt reassured, however, by the knowledge that, quote, there was another culture from which I derived, into which I could project myself with greater ease, unquote. He turned to that culture. In 1974, Rodney announced he would be returning to the West Indies again. The decision underscored yet another element of Rodney's positioning of Africa within the global revolution. While Carmichael considered Africa the pivotal launching ground, for Rodney though, Africa was only the place where one such knowledge and consciousness that will empower one to nurture an advanced revolutionary counter-hegemonic activism in one's own native cultural environment. This distinction is crucial. In essence, unlike Carmichael, Rodney did not believe it was possible to wage the global revolution from a single location, Africa. Rodney's decision to return to the Caribbean drew mixed feelings. Though most comrades with whom he had direct interactions were sympathetic, a few were surprised. Since he had spent so much time in the country, some of them presumed he could and should participate indefinitely, especially, quote, from our ideological perspective on the political left. Internationalism completely eroded elements of chauvinism that might otherwise have been present, unquote. Rodney disagreed. 
He could not perform GI activism effectively anywhere else but in his native Guyana, where culturally and linguistically he felt adapted and able to bridge both fronts of the struggles. Rodney's action should not have surprised anyone, I argue. He had earlier hinted that he came to Africa primarily to enhance his knowledge and understanding of Africa in order to serve more effectively the cause of liberation in the West Indies. Though Rodney was unapologetically Pan-African at heart, he was a proud and dedicated West Indian nationalist. While Africa was his intellectual battleground, his ideological and guerrilla battleground of cultural competence was the West Indies. On this matter, Rodney and Kamaikul diverged. Kamaikul once informed Nkrumah that the black struggle was at an impasse everywhere. It seemed to Kamaikul that Africa was the only viable context. He was not the least troubled by cultural or linguistic competency or deficiency. On the contrary, Kamaikul believed that a truly committed revolutionary could function anywhere regardless of whether or not he or she belonged culturally and linguistically. Certainly, with the, with the, I mean, certainly, difficulty with the French language in Guinea had not prevented Kamaikul from immersing himself deeper in Guinean revolutionary struggles. For Kamaikul, the future of the global colored cosmopolitan revolution did not depend on an individual cultural or linguistic competency or nativism. It should be recalled that Kamaikul began with, under, with acknowledging multiple sides of resistance in his London and Havana speeches. Subsequently, he shifted to adopting a single dominant side, Africa. Kamaikus' Africa-centered paradigm complicated Rodney's cultural competency argument. Although Rodney acknowledged shared challenges and unifying attributes across Africa and the diaspora, he also underscored cultural and linguistic differences, which were not amenable in his argument, in his words, to grand, culture, grand singular narrative. He insisted that one's battleground not be defined by or derived from Africa's preeminence, but more profoundly by one's cultural identity formation. In essence, unlike Kamakul, Rodney did not see Africa as the one fit all battlefield. Kamakul came to Africa to be closer to and fully immersed in what he characterized as my people's struggles and challenges. Rodney, on the other hand, his people's calling, on the other hand, came not from Africa, but the West Indies. He could do more as a GI in his native Guyana than in what he called somebody else's country. Issa Sibji, who was a colleague of Rodney's at, at, Rodney's at Dar es Salaam, remembered a conversation during which he tried to convince Rodney to remain in Tanzania. Quote, you can easily try and get your citizenship and continue the struggle here in Tanzania. You don't have to go back, he recalled telling Rodney. To which Rodney responded, no, comrade, I can make my contribution here, but I will not be able to grasp the idiom of the people. I will never be able to connect easily. I have to go back to the people I know and who know me, unquote. Rodney's cultural credentialism would have disqualified Kamaikul and Malcolm X, especially Kamaikul, who assumed permanent residency in Guinea, a French-speaking country. Put differently, Kamaikul's experience destabilized Rodney's cultural credential thesis. Like Rodney, Kamaikul was born and raised outside of Africa. He too came from the West Indies. He left Trinidad to the, for the United States at a young age. However, Unlike Rodney's, Kamaikus' cultural grounding was not deeply West Indian. Yet, like Rodney's, Kamaikus was not deeply African either. In Africa, both of them were non-natives. Nonetheless, the African experience left Rodney feeling inadequate and constrained, while Kamaikus felt even more empowered and culturally rooted. Rodney's dualistic paradigm mapped distinct spheres of cultural and intellectual struggles. Kamaiko did not acknowledge such distinctions. Perhaps his, his that is Kamaiko's earlier experience as a student at Howard University, coupled with participation in the civil rights movement, had nurtured in him the ability to function at all levels of the struggle. 
beyond what Rodney's cultural thesis allowed. For Carmichael, therefore, cultural and linguistic deficiencies did not constitute compelling disqualification that would justify leaving Africa and returning to his native Trinidad. Malcolm did not encounter such dilemma. Africa did not become, for Malcolm, the focus of his struggles until the last 10 months of his life. Malcolm prioritized mobilizing Africa's political and moral capital for the global struggle. He sought to internationalize the black American struggle and thus maximize the potential for success by merging the struggles with struggles of similarly oppressed people globally. He spent those crucial 10 months developing this transnational power force. In the process, he blazed the trail that Carmichael took. One can only speculate what would have happened had Malcolm not been assassinated in 1965. Would he have relocated to Africa? Either on a temporary or permanent basis? Would he have taken time out like Carmichael to seek greater knowledge and motivation in Africa? Would the growing threat of the nation of Islam assassination have compelled him to seek refuge in Africa? We can never answer these questions with any certainty. What is certain, though, is that shortly after his assassination, Malcolm's ideological cohort, Carmichael and Rodney, disagreed over whether or not Africa could function effectively as a rallying point of the global struggles. Rodney suggested that one could fight for the African Revolution wherever the circumstances and cultural conditions converged. Africa was not necessarily the one and only battlefield. In a 1974 black scholar interview, Rodney addressed this only in Africa controversy. He was asked to react to the view then propagated by some prominent blacks, notably Sokli Michael, that, quote, Africa should remain the focus of the struggle, unquote. After relocating to Guinea, Kamakul had made several public pronouncements in which he seemed to diminish the significance of other, of other sides of the revolution. Kwame Nkrumah once observed in a letter to Chris Bok shortly after Kamakul's arrival in Guinea, that he, quote, Kamakul, seems to feel that the United States had reached an impasse for the movement. Afro-Americans have done all that they can do. Europe is in a stalemate. The Middle East is continued confrontation. The whole of Asia is in turmoil. It is only in Africa that the situation is not so frozen, unquote. Rodney objected to this only in Africa claim and its implications. He was very clear and pointed in his response to the black scholar interview question. Quote, prominent spokesmen of the black cause like Stokely and Michael seem to be saying that we need to abandon the struggle in this part of the world and we seek Africa and engage in the liberation process of Africa and that the future of all black people depended on that. Quote, Rodney dismissed this all in Africa con um, only in Africa contention as unrealistic. Not all blacks were able to relocate to Africa. It was, he insisted, self-defeating to suggest that Africa is the sole or even the main vehicle of the black struggle because black struggle must be universalized wherever black people happen to be. Quote, Rodney was not abandoning his pan-African obligations. While he acknowledged similarities in the challenges of Africans and diaspora blacks, Rodney wanted due recognition also given to local, regional, and cultural divergences, specifically his native identity and obligations. His cultural credential thesis therefore questioned the very nature and character of the diaspora world Carmichael conflated. On this matter, Rodney seems ahead of his time, I argue. He's, he discerned what, decades after his death, many will reference as symptomatic of the irrelevance of the diaspora as a paradigm. The complex cultural and geospatial experiential differences of the diasporas. In a study funded by the Nordic Africa Institute in Uppsala, Sweden, co-authors Leif Manger and Mazul Asal drew attention to the growing complexity of the African diaspora, reflected in what they characterize as diasporas within and without Africa, and they call for a new approach that emphasizes micro-analysis of the mini diasporas. Call story has said the diaspora as an analytical construct resonate in contemporary African diaspora discourses. Some sites, some even some critics suggest jettisoning the concept completely and replacing it with a yet undetermined alternative. In 2016, 
At the opening of the Pan inaugural Pan African Colloquium at the University of the West Indies in Cape Verde, Barbados, Vice Chancellor Sir Hilary Beckles, a leading historian of the diaspora, called for, quote, a new language. According to him, the language of the 20th century is not appropriate for the early 21st. It has drawn its race and it's time to move on, unquote. Furthermore, he argued, the concept of diaspora has been destabilized as, quote, the geographical space. Everyone now has a diaspora. Even the diasporas have diasporas, he said. Diasporas have spawned diasporas, and those diasporas are spawning diasporas, unquote. He advocated replacing diaspora with, quote, new tools, new intellectual weapons, new perspective, new concept, unquote, that, quote, that makes sense of the new permutations of North Africa, Europe, and North Africa, I mean, and, and North America, unquote. As one critic, Richard Dozy, described it, the contemporary diaspora is a highly plural space that consists of a number of historical and geospatial experiential African descendant cultures, unquote. The need to engage the growing complexity and complication of the African diaspora was a central theme in the Nordic Africa Institute study. Manga and Asal underscored, quote, a new reality that, quote, requires rethinking of basic concepts. The fundamental question that needed rethinking, according to them, are, quote, those that belong to an earlier theorizing about communities and societies and cultures as bonded wholes of local communities as units of studies and of movements of people conceptualized in paradigms of clear-cut identities of ethnicity and race, unquote. This destabilization of diasporization was precisely what Rodney envisioned, I argue, at a time when the conflation of the African diaspora experiences seemed strategic against neocolonial challenges and threats. In essence, Rodney foresaw that the diasporas will grow beyond Africa, uh, beyond Africa's capacity to function as unifying experiential paradigm. His move away from, from the conflation and problematic only in Africa paradigm to affirmation of his West Indian obligation and adaptability foreshadowed contemporary development among African migrants in Europe. Recent studies of African immigrant communities in Europe underscore their opposition, their opposition to the superimposition of monolithic original homeland identity consciousness. In the Rodnian sense, they reject grand singular narratives or discourses premised on African ancestry that could compromise their desires and struggles for full integration into the respective adopted European nations. There have been books and articles published on this. While they acknowledge their African origin and retain strong homeland ties, they also cherish and affirm their European nationalities. No one expressed this consciousness better than Kenyan-born Catherine Gatoni, the, two, the 2008 winner of the Miss Africa Denmark contest. Quote, Africa or Danish? Is it possible to be both? Or is it a matter of being either one or the other? Unquote, she asked. She admits that she is constantly being, she's constantly dealing with what Dubois will later describe as unreconciled earlier, I'm saying earlier, will earlier describe as unreconciled strivings between the demands of her real day, according to her, and her real African. What Gatoni wished for more than anything else was for an identity. Quote, where I can be proud to be Danish just as well as I can be proud to say that I am African, unquote. In my judgment, this was precisely what Walter Rodney exemplified. Thank you. Yes, yes, let's have some questions. I'd like to draw an analogy. Yes. Europeans created, I'm just going to go with two, I'm not going to make it too complicated. Europeans have created two sets of people that do not exist except in the creation of Europeans. They came to this continent and decided all these Native Americans were not them, when in fact they had different cultures, different languages, different backgrounds, different religions. Europeans created Africa. 
There is no Africa other than a continent. But we ignored that, that and conquered both. And both are trying to deal with the outcome of that. And what both of them have in common is they're the original people and they're dealing with Europeans. And they're trying to struggle with their similarities and there are vast differences within each of them. Does that make sense? It makes sense. The, the, what, what we can call the orderization of Africans, you know, which is central to European imperial ideology was very strong. And this is precisely what Malcolm and the others are struggling about, you know, in terms of, you know, their, their call for Africa unity and global descent. This orderization was critical to European, you know, uh, 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 design in Africa. But let me just address one critical point. Africa, the very concept Africa itself was a European concept. The Africans, those who call Africans, who came to be called Africans, didn't call themselves Africans. You know, they had their ethnic identities long before the Europeans came. And in fact, the concept Africa, some argue, was actually something that evolved here, outside of Africa. But, you know, that aside, the use of this orderization, you know, of, you know, characterizing Africans in ways that justify European domination. It's a universal European you know, uh, uh, tradition, which, as you rightly point, you know, they use against the Native Americans here. So yeah, I, I do agree with your, your, your comments. Yes? Uh, what do you feel uh, Malcolm X would have accomplished uh, if he was not assassinated when it comes to the Afro-American and uh, African diaspora? That's, that's really, you know, um, it's a difficult question to answer because we do know that when he came back from Africa, there are those who argue that he was actually moving toward King. He was moving gradually toward King, you know. And we are left to wonder what would have happened had he not been assassinated, what the two of them would have done. We don't know. Because King himself, as you know, was moving away from that dream persona and was becoming much more critical of America when he was assassinated. So that the two of them went towards each other. It's one of the you know those moments in this that you, you, you wonder had it happened, we don't know you know if that would have changed the history or the course, we don't know. But you know I don't know if you know if Malcolm, what direction he would have gone with his colored cosmopolitan ideology. But what I do know is that he was, he was very much emphatic that, you know, he saw potentials in Africa. He saw potential in African leaders. That's his, you know, his vision. That's his strategy. That Africans be strong, the leaders be strong, you know, and, 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 and understand that there is this linkage that they cannot do it alone. Africans cannot do it alone. They have to also, you know, embrace the struggles of their brothers and sisters in the diaspora. That's his strategy. And, you know, and I think he would have pursued that, you know, as vigorously as Carmichael did. What I don't know is if he would have actually been compelled by challenges here, as I try to speculate here, to move to Africa in order to advance that. I don't know. Yes. I think the, the fact that these men were, were looking at African Americans in the United States in a much more global sense and their potential in a global sense, I think that point was really lost on virtually everyone in this country. You know, I mean, Malcolm X. kind of where the news went. Mm -hmm. And Silvery Carmichael was, I think, uh, painted as a, a disruptive force mm -hmm. in the United States. Yeah. But these 
the fellows who are looking at things in a much more global sense. Exactly. And, and that's, that's very impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. And that is lost, really, in the, in the conversation. It's lost that these are people who are looking at this globally, you know. Which is why they possibly were considered right? Exactly, yeah. Possible. Yes, please. about the nature between African Americans in our society and Africans and um, that type of relationship? Or is it it's not really don't hear talked about a lot? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Can you, please, I, I, I didn't get the first part of your question. Can you repeat it, please? The relationship between African-American people in our society mm -hmm. and Africans, because we have many immigrants that come from other Africa here. I've always wondered about that yeah, relationship. Yeah, yeah. What do people really feel inside about each other? OK, yeah, yeah that's a good question. Let me just say this, that books have been written on this. Articles have been written on this. I've talked about this also. But uh, let me respond this way, that there are historically rooted mutual misconceptions that we share, Africans and African Americans. You know, they're historically rooted, and culturally rooted also, that, you know, define the relationship between the two, and books have been written on that. But also, when we talk about those who categorize as recent African immigrants, you know, post-colonial immigrants, the ones that came here looking for job or going to school and so on, Books have been written about the increasing tension between them and African Americans, you know, over the years. You know, in fact, studies not too long ago show how on the issue of really uh, affirmative action, let me use that as an example, you know, there was, there, was, there was a time when at Harvard University, there was a study that was done that showed that there was a conscious attempt to ensure that that Africans, continental Africans, there is clear distinction when they say, who is black? And therefore, you know, uh, um, you know, should be considered for such privileges, affirmative action, or whatever it is, you know, that it is clear that continental Africans, you know, are not included in that definition. Let me give you an example. When I came to I used to teach in a, in, uh, in, before coming to Iowa State in a school where um, I learned for the first time that when you define black, my kids don't fall in that category. Because there's there scholarship, you know, for blacks. And when my kids applied, I told, oh, no, 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 not Africans. This is real, you know, black Americans. So there are situations like that, you know, that exist. And People don't talk about that publicly. You know, I've been a victim of that. And I'll give you, just, just, let me share, you know, this background. My, one of the books I published is titled On African Americans. On African, UN, On African Americans. And the book is about the 19th century black nationalists, some black, prominent black nationalists of the 19th century that Black scholars here have written about, published about them. When I read those publications, and I read the writings of those individuals, not the, public, not the interpretations, their own writings, their own words, I came to a different conclusion. And in my book, published in 1998, I argued that Africa, as far as Africans are concerned, when they look at imperialism, that came in the late 19th century, early, late 19th, early 20th century. That imperialism that, you know, laid the foundation for colonialism. Black Americans were part of that ideology of imperial. It wasn't just the British. It wasn't just the Germans. It was, you have to read their writings of their characterization of Africans as backward, primitive. These are black American nationalists. And I dare to challenge that in my writing. And I know what I went through in terms of the, the insults and the phone calls I received. How dare you say this publicly? How dare you say this about black Americans? Didn't your ancestors sell us into slavery? How dare you say this? I got all this. 
But I'm a historian, and my argument is that I'm a historian. I deal with the fact, and I cannot ignore that interpretation because it exists. So there are black Americans who saw Africans as primitive back on everything the British said. They said, yeah, it's true. That exists. As a historical underscore, it's there. But the more contemporary challenges that intrude into the relationship and makes it more complicated, it's about the economic you know, challenges black Americans confront today. You know, you know, when they see that, there's a sense in which African immigrants are seen as part of the problem also. And that's the reality. Yes? When, when way back at the beginning, when Obama was very thinking of running for president, early in his career, there were rumblings within the African American community that he's not from the American slave experience and will not understand us. And if you read his autobiography, as well as letters that have recently come apart, we created his blackness. He was not raised as African American. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have forced an issue. Mm -hmm. What do you mean when you say we? White European derivative people. When you say he wasn't raised as African American? He was, well, first he was raised depends how you want to derive these. Okay, if, if there's somebody here who's Italian-American, Italian. His father was Kenyan, so how do, you do, how do we define African-American? Okay, mm -hmm. there are some African-Americans that are in Chicago who are in some black press who do not define him as African-American because African-American is slave African-American, okay? Um, Charlize Theron is African, right? <laughs> if she moved here and had citizenship here, is she African American? These, these definitions are definitions we have created. Mm -hmm. And we have created Obama's blackness. He was not raised in the traditional African American sense that we, although he still experienced. Correct. Right. And that's an experience we forced on him. As he, you're saying, when he went to the States and he was in school. Correct. Correct. Right. 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 We identified him. Yes. Perfect. Um, you made a very good point uh, about this concept early, as you began to present, about the importance of history and why it is uh, so, so very, very important. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, evaluating people mm -hmm. uh, where uh, so much imposed uh, negative, negativism or uh, cloudiness has been uh, fed to us, sometimes imposed on us, uh, as we seek uh, clarity, as we seek uh, cleansing minds or healing minds, of course, um, we get closer to the truth. Yeah. And it is general, but that's this is one of the right. one yeah. of the perils uh, that history can can, can provide. Yeah. That's true. And also, just to add the point you made, you know, um, and which also reflects an part of the answer to your question is this notion of you know authenticity when it comes to who is an African, who is an African American, you know, and uh, one of the problems I had when I probably when that book came out was when I go to conferences and I'm asked, I've been asked, you know, that you know um, you you are not from here. You don't know the black American experience, you've not experienced it. So because of that, how dare you make that such comments? You are from Africa, you you know. And and that decision suddenly becomes important that you know that I've not experienced something. So I cannot write about it, you know. And um, anyway. You've experienced that from your own perspective, and the story that we're talking about, the part of the group of people who have been affected by those experiences and other people in your groups, like 
In fact, what I argue actually in some of my writings, I argue that if people say that I've not ex- or say, oh, you've not experienced racism, or which is what they say, you know, say Africans, continental Africans don't experience racism as to the degree that uh, African Americans have, and so on, so forth. And I say, you know, because I give my example, I left my country for that reason. The racism I experience is not white black; it's black black. And back home, they call it tribalism, you know, but it's as vicious as racism goes that in many African countries, you know. And when I talk about my personal experiences, it can't go any worse than that in terms of, you know, experiencing racism. But then it's a fellow black person, a fellow African. Yes. Yeah. Um, the students at the academy for Scholastic University of Success has changed over the years quite a bit. The high school program, and that we have uh, a large number of African students in our program. So, yeah, African you know, students that are here from the United States that have been born and raised here. And then we have African students that are part of the program. And um, it has really strengthen the program, and that is the exact thing that those young people, high school students, are discussing Mm -hmm. and talking about. Um, They want to, they've been, uh, they get to decide what seminars, what they talk about in the seminars that they have on Wednesdays, and that was one of the topics uh, that came up that they wanted to discuss. Yeah, let me just add that. Even at Iowa State University, we've had it twice now where we have a panel of African Americans and Africans talk about this issue. Uh-huh. Because they are aware of it. Uh, it exists. Yeah. 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 I think of that, uh, those multiple that scores that uh, Malcolm X was talking about, I think that's what we kind of fit into, and into some of those, because you do have that, uh, that relationship where, you know, you say, as an African American and as an African, your experience is not going to be the same as mine. I've heard it from, from, from both from both ways. I have African friends and just something as simple as me when they get die shiki, they can say, oh well that's cultural appropriation. <laughs> so I mean i yeah, so I I've, I've, I've heard it from, from from both sides, you know, and I, I just think it all stems from ignorance, you know, and not being able to know uh, the biggest thing with uh, the African diaspora and African Americans is by coming over on the slave ship, a lot of us lost our culture. You know, a lot of people can say, oh, my grandmother was born in Germany in 1563, and I come from this, this, this. And a lot of African Americans don't have that. Yeah. You know, they have no place that they can say, you know, this is where my family come from. This is where I come from. And, um, you know, when you get with uh, people of the African nation, you know, depending on whether you're from Nigeria or Cameroon, if you're a person that's trying to learn about those roots and things like that, you're trying to learn from, from them. So I think sometimes that ignorance, you know, can cause confusion as well. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Great. Thank you. What's it? Yes. But just as Europeans, in my view, mm-hmm. have created an Africa and created a Native American existence, mm-hmm. they have also created a European existence that doesn't exist. They didn't get along with each other too well either. <laughs> Okay, and although some people may be able to trace their lineage back to this town, if you look at a map of Europe, everybody overran everybody. Yeah. And these people who can trace their lineage back to here may not be the majority of people. Because they moved around a lot, whether they want to. My, 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 wife, my wife's father is from Sweden. And one day in a conversation she had with him, she said, I'm half Swedish. And he said, well, maybe 10% Spanish. And she said, how did that happen? Uh-huh. And he said, us white people got around. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so so there, there's more intermixing yeah. than people want to discuss. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Oh, thank you. 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 All right. So.
uh, this presentation was generously funded by Humanities Iowa, which is a, a funder for humanities organizations across our state. Um, and as part of that, our series gets evaluated by an independent evaluator and by everyone who comes to our presentations that are part of this series. And so on your way out, there is a table that has surveys kind of laid out in pens. Please, please, please fill one of those out. Um, our grant funding kind of stipulates that we need those from you. So I uh, just asked to see what you thought of tonight, what you'd like to see in the future, and how you heard about this. So just take a couple minutes on your way out and do that for us. And if we can give one more round of applause, you don't have to. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.